an apology to Lady Carteret, verses written during Lord Carteret's administration of Ireland, by Jonathan Swift as Lord Carteret's residence in Ireland as Viceroy was a series of cabals against the authority of the Prime Minister, he failed not, as well from his love of literature as from his hatred to Walpole, to attach to himself as much as possible the distinguished author of the Drapier. Letters. By the interest which Swift soon gained with the Lord Lieutenant, he was enabled to recommend several friends, whose high church or Tory principles had hitherto obstructed their preferment. The task of forwarding the views of Delany, in particular, led to several of Swift's liveliest poetical effusions, while, on the other hand, he was equally active in galling, by his satire, Smedley. Another Whig beau esprit, who, during this amphibious administration, sought the favor of a literary lord lieutenant, by literary offerings and poetical adulation. These pieces, with one or two connected with the same subject, are here thrown together, as they seem to reflect light upon each other. Scott, a lady, wise as well as fair, whose conscience always was her care, thoughtful upon a point of moment, would have the text as well as comment. So hearing of a grave divine, she sent to bid him come to dine. But, you must know he was not quite so grave as to be unpolite. Thought human learning would not lessen the dignity of his profession. And if you'd heard the man discourse, or preach, you'd like him scarce the worse. He long had bid the court farewell, retreating silent to his cell suspected for the love he bore to one who swayed some time before, which made it more surprising how he should be sent for thither now. The message told, he gapes, and stares, and scarce believes his eyes or ears, could not conceive what it should mean, and fain would hear it told again. But then the squire so trim and nice, twere rude to make him tell it twice, so bowed, was thankful for the honor, and would not fail to wait upon her. His beaver brushed, his shoes, and gown, away he trudges into town, passes the lower castle yard, and now advancing to the guard, he trembles at the thoughts of state, for, conscious of his sheepish gait, his spirits of a sudden failed him, he stopped, and could not tell what ailed him. What was the message I received? Why certainly the captain raved, to dine with her, and come at three. Impossible, it can't be me, or maybe I mistook the word, my lady, it must be my Lord, my lord, s abroad, my lady too, what must the unhappy doctor do? Is Captain Cratcherode, one, here, pray? No? Nay, then tis time for me to go. Am I awake, or do I dream? I'm sure he called me by my name, named me as plain as he could speak, and yet there must be some mistake. Why, what a jest should I have been, had now my lady been within? What could I've said? I'm mighty glad she went abroad she'd thought me mad. The hour of dining now is past. Well then, I'll e'en go home and fast. And, since I, escaped being made a scoff, I think I'm very fairly off. My lady now returning home, calls, Cratcherode, is the doctor come? He had not heard of him, pray. See, tis now a quarter after three. The captain walks about, and searches through all the rooms, and courts, and arches, examines all the servants round, in vain, no doctors to be found. My lady could not choose but wonder. Captain, I fear you've made some blunder. But, pray, tomorrow go at ten. I'll try his manners once again, if. Rudeness be th, effect of knowledge, my son shall never see a college. The captain was a man of reading, and much good sense, as well as breeding, who, loath to blame, or to incense, said little in his own defense. Next day another message brought. The doctor, frightened at his fault, is dressed, d, and stealing through the crowd, now pale. As death, then blushed and bowed, panting, and faltering, hummed and hawed, her ladyship was gone abroad. The captain too, he did not know whether he ought to stay or go, begged she'd forgive him. In conclusion, my lady, pitying his confusion, called her good nature to relieve him, told him, she thought she might believe him, and would not only grant his suit, but visit him, and eat some fruit, provided, at a proper time, he told the real truth in rhyme. Twas to no purpose to oppose, she'd hear of no excuse in prose. The doctor stood not to debate, glad to compound at any rate. So, bowing, seemingly complied, though, if he durst, he had denied. But first, resolved to show. His taste, was too refined to give a feast. 
he'd treat with nothing that was rare, but winding walks in purer air, would entertain without expense, or pride or vain magnificence, for well he knew, to such a guest the plainest meals must be the best. To stomachs clogged with costly fair simplicity alone is rare, while high, and nice, and curious meats are really but vulgar treats. Instead of spoils of Persian looms, the costly boast of regal rooms, thought it more courtly and discreet to scatter roses at her feet. Roses of richest dye, that shone with native luster, like her own. Beauty that needs no aid of art through every sense to reach the heart. The gracious dame, though well she knew all this was much beneath her due, liked everything, at least thought fit to praise it par manicure d'aquit. Yet she, though seeming pleased, can't bear the scorching sun, or chilling air. Disturbed alike at both extremes, whether he shows or hides his beams, though seeming pleased at all she sees, starts at the ruffling of the trees, and scarce can speak for want of breath, in half a walk fatigued to death. The doctor takes his hint from hence, t, apologize his late offence. Madam, the mighty power of use now strangely pleads in my excuse. If you unused have scarcely strength to gain this walk's untoward length. If, frightened at a scene so rude, through long disuse of solitude, if, long confined to fires and screens, you dread the waving of these greens. If you, who long have breathed the fumes of city fogs and crowded rooms, do now solicitously shun the cooler air and dazzling sun. If his majestic eye you flee, learn hence tea, excuse and pity me. Consider what it is to bear the powdered courtier's witty sneer. To see th, important man of dress scoffing my college awkwardness. To be the strutting cornet's sport to run the gauntlet of the court, winning my way by slow approaches, through crowds of coxcombs and of coaches, from the first fierce cockaded sentry, quite through the tribe of waiting gentry, to pass so many crowded stages, and stand the staring of your pages, and after all, to crown my spleen, be told, you are not to be seen, or, if you are, be forced to bear the awe of your majestic air. And can I then be faulty found, in dreading this vexatious round? Can it be strange, if I eschew a scene so glorious and so new? Or is he criminal that flies the living luster of your eyes?